to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Tim. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Katha Pop who's gonna give us a talk today. Um, as you can see here, the title about automated mineralogy and uh, uh, the, applying this tool throughout the mine life cycle. Of course, um, Kata is uh, a research associate professor here at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, uh, we've been lucky to have her here for quite a while now. Uh, I'm sure that whistle is. <laughs> um, and uh, she built and runs uh, the MMC, the Minerals and Materials Characterization Facility. So as you'll see, Tata is an expert in applying a, a large toolbox of advanced analytical techniques to help us better understand the processes of ore formation, as well as uh, interpreting uh, trace and uh, trace element and other um, geochemical characteristics to better understand uh, geologic processes. Um, and yeah, so um, uh, her lab uh, runs things uh, for a lot of our students as well as uh, commercially for uh, various clients. So she has quite a bit of experience working in the uh, public and private sector on these projects. And she's gonna give us uh, a nice overview of some of the applications of those today. All right, thank you. A second to adjust this. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Can everybody hear me? I think you switch it on. I did not switch it on. On. That probably helps. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. So we're going to go into a little bit of a soiree all around what we do. Every project I'm showing today is an ongoing current project, which also means none of them are complete. So let's go. All right, so we're all kind of familiar with the mine life cycle, right? So generally we start early with mineral exploration and assessment. We worry about deposit ore models and how the ore is formed, mine planning, mining, ore control, uh, mineral processing. We worry about waste rock and the what environmental implications waste rock might have and tailings, but now also in a new context, waste, waste as a resource, and all the way through reclamation. Mining and mineral exploration is a really... <laughs> Oops, sorry. That's all right, I'll just continue. It's a really complex field, right? And not one group can solve the problems and the, answer the questions that we're facing. So, we always have, we always will work across different disciplines, which you could be seeing down there, economic geology, geophysics, math and statistics, computer science, mining, and <laughs> mining and extractive metallurgy, mineral economics, and all those, obviously I work here in mines, we're doing a lot of workforce development. And today I wanna show you a little bit of what we do my research group and collaborators in this general arena. And a lot of it centers around data, data acquisition, data combination, data co-registration, data mining, and how we can use data across the range of scales to answer and to advance our knowledge and to advance what we can do, advance mineral exploration, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. It's not advancing. Yeah. All right. So I'll be talking, or automated mineralogy will be kind of the overarching theme automated mineralogy or quantitative mineralogy. Here's an example image, and I'll get back to that um, you know, a few more times. Automated mineralogy images are really false colored images of our material in hand. And as, as long as we can define different minerals and phases by their discrete chemistry, we can map them and we can assign a color and we can produce these false colored images, which we then basically use, or we basically use image analysis to extract different types of information. So quantitative mineralogy has been used extensively over the last 
50 years in extractive metallurgy and to develop you know, processes and mechanisms to extract ore minerals you know, in, in, the extra, in that process. But automated mineralogy is a really data-rich product that can also be used in a predictive context and really be used in a lot of other areas. So here, we often encounter this, right? Geology, unlike other areas, we really go across scales. We go from the kilometer scale to many, or kilometers, many meters, and we have drill core, and we will want to go down to the centimeter inches scale in thin section. We go down the millimeter scale once we will have a closer look at the mineralogy, maybe our ore minerals, and then we go down to the micron scale. But how does that all fit together? How do we go from the kilometer scale down to the micron scale? How do we go back to up when we figure something out in the micron scale? And what does that mean to the kilometer scale? So automated mineralogy or quantitative mineralogy, we have to do a few things or keep a few things in mind. For example, when we sample our material, what are we sampling? Are we taking representative samples? We have to bear in mind that what we might have to understand that there's sometimes compositional changes or textural changes down hole, for example. Then we want to characterize our material, the mineralogy and the textures. Then we can quantify the mineralogy or the textual relationships. Uh, we can quantify the abundance, the mineral modal abundance, the occurrence, blocking and liberation characteristics, the size distribution of our minerals of interest and association, mineral association, and other parameters that might be of interest and important to our project. And then we can scale all that information back up from the micron scale, from the millimeter scale, up to the meter scale, up to the kilometer scale. But how do we do that? So here on this image is a classic geometallurgy picture. In that context, automated mineralogy has been used, as I said, basically for 50 years, for a really long time. We can scan, we mount our material, um, our concentrate, for example, we scan it, we can then extract what the different minerals are, we can sort them by size, we can look at the different minerals, we see how they occur together or whether they're liberated, what the size is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but automated mineralogy or quantitative mineralogy can be used in a lot of other and different you know, <clears throat> types of projects in a different context. And here are the different topics I want to introduce you today. And they're all, as I said, ongoing student projects. All of them are not yet complete. So this is what we're doing right now. This is literally what is happening during the day, just across Cavern to Commons in Burstead Hall. All right, the first project. This is Danny Schmidt, unfortunately sick today, but a, a PhD student in, in the Department of Geology. And his project is basically uh, mineralogy across scales and how we can improve and advance mineral exploration and assessment. Well, in mineral exploration and assessment, we look for minerals. And we talk about that now a lot in the news, right? We need all these minerals and metals for the green energy transition. We continue to need our base metals. We continue to need our precious metals, but we now also are looking for critical minerals, <clears throat> cobalt, germanium, nickel, tellurium, but there are challenges. And in geology, we have lots of them. As I said earlier, we work with really big data sets. Think geophysical surveys, they're huge, right? We have heterogeneous data sets. Our data sets are heterogeneous in scale and modality. So to bring them together is really difficult. Our data interpretation is often insufficient and we have scaling issues. How do we go from what I find in the lab at the micron scale up to the kilometer scale? We don't work in 2D. Many other disciplines work in 2D, maybe 3D, but we also have time. So we have a fourth dimension. 
We have to integrate our data. We have lots of data, but we also deal with data scarcity. Right? We're having drill holes, but we have very little or no information in between drill holes. So how do we tackle all these challenges? The example I brought here, how we're trying to tackle these challenges is around this geophysical survey. This geophysical survey was, was funded by the US Geological Survey through the Earth MRI program. And the project I'm about to tell you is designed to improve our ability to inter interpret these geophysical surveys. They're inherently hard to interpret. So how, what can we do to connect this airborne geophysical sur survey with what is actually going on in the subsurface so we can better interpret it? All right, we're now in Idaho, up here in orange. This is the, the rough outline of the Idaho Cobalt Belt. You may have heard of Raymond Sunshine and uh, Blackbird before. In this particular project, we're looking at the Iron Creek deposit down here in the southeastern portion of the Idaho Cobalt Belt. Here's a little geological map of the Iron Creek property. And we have on the left-hand side, Iron Creek, and on the right-hand side, the Ruby Zone. So from now on, when I refer to Iron Creek, I'm referring specifically to this side of the deposit on the western side of this uh, coin fault. And on the, on the eastern side is the Ruby Zone. And we have two drill holes. One is from the Ruby Zone, IC2202. And then we have one from the Iron Creek area, IC1728. The Iron Creek deposit is hosted in the banded siltide member of the Mesoproterozoic Apple Creek Formation. Uh, the host rock is quartz muscovite biotite chloride with minor apatite, plagioclase, and different iron manganese oxides. The ore contains or consists of pyrite, pyrite, cacopyrite, um, magnetite, and cobalt minerals. So I walk you real fast through the general mineralogy, and then we get into what we're trying to accomplish. So as I said, we now always talk about the Ruby Zone on the east and Iron Creek, Creek area to the west of the corner fault. We have a pre or stage, which are significantly different on those two sides of the corner fault, even though the two sub areas are, or the, the, the ore is hosted in the same band of siltite. Here in the Iron Creek area, we have pre or pyrite, early pyrite, whereas on the Ruby zone, we have early magnetite and very little pyrite. The main ore stage, we have lots of cobaltiferous pyrite. And these are these two are automated mineralogy images. So we have false colored images of our areas of interest. And not only can we see what the mineralogy is, but we also get geochemical information. For example, here you see this big pyrite. This is all pyrite. And in yellow, there's likely still cobalt in that pyrite. But in those areas, the cobalt concentration is fairly low, less than a couple weight percent. In areas that are in this wine red color, we have elevated cobalt concentrations within those within that pyrite. So we have cobaltiferous pyrite. So on the main stage, or we have pyrite, different type pyrites. We have cacopyrite, as you can see here in the middle in orange, and we have different catcherite vasite minerals cobalt and nickel sulfides. And our alteration is, you know, we see chloride alteration. Late stage, we see silicification in silica veins. And only in the silica veins right here do we see some base metals come in, salarite and galena. We also see cobaltiferous pyrotide, which is breaking apart to marcasite, iron oxides, and again, a discrete cobalt mineral catcherite. 
cobalt sulfide. Okay. So when we want to explore for these, and we look at our geophysical survey, we see these mag magnetic highs all around here. And as you can see, we have abundant magnetite. And common knowledge is and was to look for high magnetic susceptibility readings to find the cobalt ore. But, so Danny, as I said, Danny Schmidt did the work. Here's basically a stratigraphic column with lots of gold band of siltite. If some may be dikes, and here we have one of the ore zones. So we're on the ruby zone side. The ruby zone does not have any copper ore of any significance. There's very, very minor copper pyrite, but it's cobalt ore, right? It's a cobalt ore zone. And in conjunction with my colleague, Dr. Monike, who's sitting in the back, um, he scanned drill core from the, from the Ruby zone using this continuous XRF core scanner down hole. It's a wonderful tool, takes a lot of work and calibration, but if everything is working well, it's a rapid way to gain the geochemical composition down hole. So here we have cobalt and we have iron in percent downhole or PPM in percent downhole. He also collected co-register magnetic susceptibility data downhole. And also, he also ran his core here on this hyperspectral scanner with every all the different data sets completely co-registered. And here he indicated the chloride concentration downhole. If you now have a closer look at this ore zone, the cobalt ore zone, okay, we have elevate, elevated cobalt concentrations. That's great, that's what we were looking for. Elevated iron concentrations, makes sense. Huge, extremely high magnetic susceptibility values, extremely high. <clears throat> and in elevated chloride concentrations. And I said earlier, we have that chloride uh, alteration. So all that makes sense. Now we go to the Iron Creek side. Oh, look what time it is. <laughs> okay, now let's go to the Iron Creek side. Again, a stratigraphic column with the banded sulfide, and here are three different ore zones. These two ore zones are cobalt ore. This is copper cobalt ore, but there's still a little bit of copper in here. Okay, so there's definitely some copper pyrite on the Iron Creek side. This here, we have lots of copper pyrite. We kind of see the same thing here, copper concentrations downhole, uh, cobalt concentrations downhole in PPM, copper concentrations downhole, iron concentrations downhole, and magnetic susceptibility values. Not quite as high, but still very high. But if you now look at the three different ore zones, our magnetic susceptibility values are elevated here and here. They're not elevated here. They're not elevated where we have significant copper in our ore zone. So looking for that in increased or elevated magnetic susceptibility value will not lead you to the ore zone. Well, that's when we go back in. Okay, so now we have some sort of an understanding of what's going on down hole. Do we understand why? Not necessarily. So we go back in, we can use the data to guide our subsampling strategy. And here are the drill hole boxes. We took samples in different locations. Here you can see overview scans, again, automated mineralogy, pyrite in yellow, copper pyrite in orange. Um, we have different clay minerals, we have chloride. Okay. We can also highlight here, for example, all of our cobalt findings, because that's what we typically care about too. If we explore for cobalt, we want to know where the cobalt is and how much cobalt there is. And we can further guide even higher resolution analyses. So here now you see two BSE images taken on a field emission SEM, which we also have in the department. 
but now we're at a hundred micron scale bar or 20 micron scale bar. But what you can see in those areas, so we have copper, a cobalt copper zone, our magnetite is almost entirely replaced by pyrite and gone. There are not many of those remnants left. Obviously, Danny, the student, our student was looking for these particular textures. But it seems like that wherever we have copper, our magnetite is destroyed and replaced by pyrite. Therefore, our magnetic susceptibility values or readings are not as high. That's where our exploration implications come in. All right. Let's switch gears. So this is now a project on the to better understand the occurrence and the sequestration of minerals. This particular project, in particular, critical minerals, <laughs> critical elements, right? Uh, Philip, he's in the audience right there. So if you have questions, he will be well suited to ask them. And Lindsay Patterson, she just graduated, but both of them worked on better understanding the, the occurrence and sequestration of critical minerals in VMS deposits. Because we're all now talking about critical minerals, right? And sometimes, yeah, you know, there are presentations and people say, oh, this is amazing. We analyzed this rock or this water or this something or other. And we found all these critical elements. Well, that's great and all. We can measure them, but only because we can measure them doesn't mean it's economic, right? We need to better understand, and we have to understand what the sequestration is. And that's what Philip and Lindsay were trying to do. So Philip in particular worked on tellurium. Tellurium is a critical element, and it was in the critical minerals lists of, from the, of the Department of the Interior, both in 2018 and 2022. It's primarily used in solar panels. And it is likely that demand would likely far outpace um, uh, supply within the next few decades. Tellurium is an extremely rare element in the Earth's crust. And right now, 90% of our tellurium is produced as a byproduct from high-grade high copper ore. So 90% of, of tellurium comes from copper ore processing as a byproduct. But only 4% of tellurium leaves the mine site on average. It's basically only the tellurium that happens to be in that copper concentrate. So nobody goes out and actually tries to go after the tellurium, right? It's produced as a byproduct from copper ore processing. And out of that 4%, only 2% actually make it to market. The rest we lose through during processing. So we have to figure something out as a society if we want to go you know, further that path of the green energy transition, use all the good things, solar panels, et cetera, et cetera. But we have a real knowledge gap on the sequestration and occurrence of many of these critical minerals and how they're sequestered in known deposits and known deposit types. So if we want robust sources for critical minerals, we also need robust geological mineral mineralogical data. And knowing more about the occurrence, distribution, formation, formation mechanisms will have implications on our understanding of mineral system models, uh, resource and res reserve estimates, and mineral processing, and how we do these things in the future. 
So the deposit Philip studied in, in this particular case is the sub or is the Perseverance VMS deposit in Canada located right here. This is the Abitibi Greenstone Belt. There's the Perseverance VMS deposit. It's a subsea floor replacement VMS and was mined between 2008 and 2013. It's hosted in rhyolitic lava flows and it has a branches facies overprint. And there are the. All right. So, what both Philip and, and Lindsay did, they wanted to understand where the tellurium is, right? So, they went ahead and obviously they did optical petrography. We always start with optical petrography. But then they also did overview mineralogy scans. This is a figure that was put together, right, from the different types of ores, different ore mineralogies, different textural varieties. And these scans were scanned at 15 micron stepping out. So it's fairly high resolution, but we may or may not be able to really get a lot of information on the tellurium minerals and the tellurium mineralogy. So what he did or what they did is they do a they did a tellurium mineral search basically. So it's possible to configure the automated mineralogy scan in a way that we can say, okay, we're really only interested in certain kinds of minerals. So go ahead and only scan and search for those minerals and please do it at one or 1.5 micron resolution. And then we can flag the findings, right? We can go ahead and say, oh, there's the finding and we can literally flag these findings so we can go back in later. We don't have to actually manually search for these minerals ourselves. And then in general, we can do image analysis, right? There are false colored images, that's what we get. And then based on image analysis, we can get all sorts of statistical parameters. So based on these flagged in minerals in automated mineralogy, Philip was then able to go back to the field emission SEM and do traditional PEC imaging, right? Backscattered electron imaging. This shows us the phase contrast of our material of interest. And if you look at that scale bar, 2.5 micron. If you have to find those manually under the microscope or an SEM, that would take a lot of time. So using these automated mineralogy scans to find these so we can then target areas of interest and go in and image these and take plan analyses is much more efficient. And you can see some of these tellurium grains are composite grains with altarite, lead tellurite, and hesite, silver tellurite, tellurobismuthite, bismuth tellurite, or here, matagamite, cobalt tellurite. <clears throat> Why, in fact, Philip went through all these, and I think he spent a lot of time on the SEM, and then he went on to do electron probe microanalysis, and in fact, he identified 17 different tellurium minerals. All right, that's all great and all, but in reality, if we're trying to figure out if, if something is economic and if we should go after the tellurium, we may or may not care too much about this. But what we're gonna care about is what's the grain size distribution for those different tellurium minerals. So on these graphs, they're all kind of the same just for the different tellurium minerals. You see how many grains have what grain size. And you see, Right here, right at the very beginning, and I read this to you, one to five micron, there are a lot of grains. And every mineral processing or extractive metallurgy person is gonna tell you we cannot recover that. Five micron, really? Okay, well, that kind of stinks, but good thing, if you look at it in volume percent and not individual grains, in volume percent, we have 50% of our tellurium endowment is larger than 35 micron. 
And we were told from our friends in extractive metallurgy that that is doable. So liberate grains that are 35 micron and larger. Still pretty fine. Another parameter we can look at is indicated here. It's a big table. Up here, you see different tellurium minerals. Going down is the general mineralogy. And what this table indicates is which minerals those min tellurium minerals are associated with. It has no genetic implication. It just literally means where are the tellurium minerals? Do they occur with sphalerite, with cacopyrite? or with gang. And if we look, here's our sphalerite, pyrite, and cacopyrite. And we can see a good portion of our tellurium minerals occur with sphalerite and cacopyrite, which will end up in our concentrate. Pyrite is not so great. And here also we have a good chunk with dolomite, for example, that will go to waste. Right, at least most of the time, unless we actually specifically go for a commodity. <laughs> All right, so the whole per workflow we identified Perseverance hosts a diverse suite of telluride minerals. And that's really the first deposit scale investigation to look for that critical element, critical mineral. Philip characterized the samples. Terrorites are frequently associated with ore minerals. That's a good thing. The grain sizes are relatively, quote unquote, coarse. And by volume percent, more than 50% of the tellurium or tellurium minerals might be, is, yeah, we're able to liberate those. Um, and Philip wrote here, he helped me a bit with this, with, you know, these slides. Nature has done the work for us. As I said earlier, there was a gracious metamorphic overprint, which helped with grain coarsening and, you know, the discrete tellurium minerals formed during the process. We can also do great estimates using, whoops, automated mineralogy. See, there you go. And, um, well, he also wrote it here. Textual evidence suggests coarse discrete tellurides may be linked to the metamorphic overprint. And all this is really a, a workflow he developed, right? A workflow to really try to understand the occurrence of distribution and the sequestration in, in this case, the different tellur tellurium minerals and um, our tellurium endowment. All right. So we looked at mineralogy across scales, kind of mineral, you know, mineral exploration, mineral assessment. We looked at how to better understand a mineral endowment. It can be critical minerals, it can be precious metals. It's really not that different. Um, now we want to figure out how do this waste rock and tailings potentially impact surface waters, the environment. Right? How can we better understand and predict what the impact is going to be? Well, here are some, some common knowledge, right? Acid mine or rock drainage potential is highly dependent on the mineralogy. Oh, yeah. Um, we have certain minerals, propylytic alteration and carbonates that can buffer the acid rock or acid mine drainage. Okay. Obviously there are different tests, the acid base accounting tests, leach tests, et cetera, et cetera. We have to go through, right? the permitting process to make sure we kind of understand what's going on. But wouldn't it be nice if we had a much simpler tool at hand in conjunction with those more advanced methods to better understand and predict to acid generating potential. So here's uh, the, the mineralogy of, of different samples or and tailing samples. And uh, 
the mineral model abundance indicated in this bar in these bar graphs, right? It's a it's a way to look at the mineralogy and mineralogical differences. And we have this project here in southern Peru, in the state of Arequipa, and there are different watersheds. And there's a lot of active mining happening and going on in, the, in, in Arequipa, a lot of artisanal mining. And it was really important for you know, politicians and, and local communities to understand what's the contribution of this artisanal mining and the tailings and the waste rock on these watersheds. And also how can we plan for the future? The same applies really to, to any kind of mining operation. So Isaac Simon, who was on the picture, um, he used classic methods, <laughs> static leach tests. He looked at the leachate composition um, he also did ABA tests, et cetera, et cetera. But he also looked at the mineralogy before and after any all, all of these tests to better understand what changes on a really granular level. How does the mineralogy change and how does the model abundance change and what chemical reactions are happening? And with that understanding, he engaged in geochemical modeling <laughs> to really pin down the chemical reactions that are happening during all of these different uh, tests and in nature. He also then did some multiple regression modeling and some validation work. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. So I already showed this map. That's the Department of Arequipa all the way in the south, in south, in southern Peru. Um, he sampled different tailings piles that are representative of different you know, deposit types, you know, depending on where the tailings are sourced from. And he looked at the mineralogy. We looked at the mineralogy, but he also did this NAC pH test, net acid generation test, and he did PACE pH tests. Kind of classic tests that are often done, right, to understand what the waste or what the tailings look like. And he plotted them up again in a, in a graph that is commonly used, widely used. And in general, the lower the pH of those tests, the higher the risk for acid mine drainage. So one is um, you know, just uh, test with a, a flushing tests, and the other one is more like a reacting um, test. So we can look at the tailings differently how do you react and how they might like whether there's acid generation generating potential and we definitely identified that there are some of these tailings that were sampled are highly likely to be acid generating and then there are other tailings they're really not that much of a concern So we looked at the mineralogy and you've seen these bar graphs before for all those different sites. And as I said, they're kind of corresponding to different deposit types that were mined. And um, not only did Isaac did look at the general mineralogy, but he also simulated in geochemical models what is happening during these NAC tests. And here you can see a bunch of bar graphs with a bunch of different minerals. And it basically says something about if the here's zero, if the bars are positive, that the mineral is likely to precipitate if it can. And if the bars are negative, then the, the mineral is likely to go into dissolution, right? And that can tell you something about um, whether there's acid generation. So again, generally widely accepted. The mineral modal abundance of calcite as a buffer, pyrite as an acid generator, chloride directly control whether acid rock drainage forms. Okay, that's great. Um, obviously, we also have additional characteristics that contribute to acid rock drainage. For example, um, the calcite pyrite liberation characteristics. Uh, pyrite is entirely enclosed and encased in, in quartz. It cannot form acid because it cannot react. If we have the grain size, it's going to be important. If we have very finely grained material, we have a lot of more, a lot more reactive surface, and we're more likely to 
you know, engage in reactions. But putting all his work together, which is obviously a lot longer, um, he developed an empirical formula for that area, right? You cannot just say this formula and use a somewhere completely different, but for this area, an empirical formula that gives you a pretty good understanding very quickly based on the mineralogy alone and data that can be acquired with automated mineralogy quickly, whether a material is likely to produce acid. <laughs> What's the beeping? Oh, it's not you. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're almost done. The last two topics are very similar. So here this is Zaid and Pablo. And we're talking a little bit about what we call maximizing the value of hyperspectral data. So we talked a lot about subsampling, kind of going small and understanding the material in detail on a really small scale. But how do we go back up? We can't really do automated mineralogy on drill core, right? We make little samples, we load them in a little instrument. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? <clears throat> well, one method that works really well on a really large scale is hyperspectral data. Right? We can acquire hyperspectral data on, from a satellite, airborne, UAVs, drill core, or even smaller samples. The problem is, then in hyperspectral data, we typically use SWIR and v near, you know, spectral wavelength spectrum. The problem is the mineral identification is based on what we call diagnostic features. It's a squiggly line and many minerals have what we call a diagnostic features. At a certain wavelength, there is a big squiggle all well, this way usually. Those squiggles are caused by, you know, we have an electron transfer of metal ions and that would be vibration. Uh, it's caused by groups such as aluminum, um, hydroxide, magnesium OH groups and carbonates. But the problem is with this method, many of our most important minerals like quartz and plagioclase and other minerals like olivine do not have diagnostic features. So they're invisible in hyperspectral mapping. So typically what we use hyperspectral mapping for, or this hyperspectral data, is to map out our alteration, which we did here exactly. So what I showed earlier from the Idaho cobalt belt, this is core from the Idaho cobalt belt, and highlighted is the, the chloride alteration and muscovite elite. But obviously the mineralogy of our core is, is a lot more than just um, our alteration minerals. So how do we go about being able to extract more information out of the spectrum, this reflectance spectrum, than what we can actually see when we look at it? Well, in the modern day and age, we use things like machine learning. We go ahead and we use automated mineralogy data. Those are automated mineralogy scans, quartz, potassium feldspar. Both of them are invisible or considered invisible in hyperspectral data because they don't have diagnostic features. But with this method here, where we preserve the mineralogy and the textual information, we can build training data sets on small pieces with co-registered, aligned hyperspectral data with automated mineralogy data. And we can train a machine learning algorithm. Now here you see a picture of two core boxes, mm -hmm. and here you see the interpreted data of those two core boxes, applying that machine learning algorithm that trained on those 
little or samples. And suddenly we're able to image the full mineralogy, okay, full mineralogy, quartz and feldspar in these two core boxes. Two minerals that are considered invisible and swear and <clears throat> be near. So we can use automated mineralogy data as the basis for machine learning algorithm to really maximize the value of hyperspectral data. And then last but not least, here's Matthew. He's working on maximizing the value of X-ray fluorescence data. It's a very similar thought process behind this project. We have drill core in this case from the Grand Island Mining District just up the road in Boulder County. Uh, we have different igneous lithologies in the subsurface, the monsonite, magnetite, dunite, peroxinite, lumpur fire, et cetera. Again, also he scanned his core, but this time on the continuous XRF scanner. And to refresh your memory, because I've been talking for way too long now, this is what those XRF scans look like down hole. This is the example from, from the Idaho Cobalt Belt, but we have the stratigraphic column and we have our different elements down hole and percent and PPM, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fantastic, right? Absolutely incredible. But if we go back to the to the Grand Island Mining District, that chemistry may or may not tell us what the distribution of those different igneous rock units is. But that's what we need. That's what we want to know. That's what's going to help us better understand the subsurface. So what Matthew did, he used data clustering based on those F, continuous XRF data down hole and looked at his data and was then able, as I said, to cluster the data and to assign or reassign, trace back which igneous lithology or which cluster represents which igneous lithology here. Well, that's a first step, that's great. But for this particular application, we really want to know what the mineral modal abundance is down hole the entire, the entire way. We don't just want to know, oh, we have monsonite. Oh, cool, we have a dunite. We really want to know what is the mineralogy? What's the mineral modal abundance down hole? So also here's building what we call a training data set, right? In machine learning or artificial intelligence, we build training data sets to then apply what the machine learning algorithm has learned to a larger data set. So from each cluster, he took a sample or samples and scanned them in automated mineralogy. We again get these false colored images. We again get the mineral modal abundance. We again get the textual information. So up there is a magnetite dunite, magnetite peroxinite, magnetite gabbro. He gets the mineral model abundance. He determined the actual chemical formula, not just, oh, it's aluminite, oh, it's chloride, but exactly what is the stoichiometry of that chloride, of that aluminite. And then he can use this information in conjunction with the corresponding XRF data set on that subsample and basically do normative mineralogy to recalculate that chemical data into mineralogical data down hole. And then we can extract the mineralogy down hole and try to actually truly understand what our rock units look like, what they are in the subsurface. All right, long story short, we walk through sampling, subsampling, trying to understand what's going on, understanding the sub subsurface, understanding compositional changes. We characterized, we characterized the mineralogy and textural relationships. We quantified, right? We use these false colored images to really gain statistical information on our samples, and we scaled back up. 
Those are all the people who did the work. And we're really thankful for a bunch of people who have helped us and collaborators and our different funding sources. That's for me. Thank you. Questions for our speaker? Lou. 